Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University and welcome to Vlog 263 Ableism in the Academy. This is brilliant. This vlog comes via request from Madeline, and can I say this is not the Madeline who requested the porous PhD a couple of vlogs ago. Now you know your life's in good nick when you've got two Madelines in your life. So this is fantastic, but Madeline had seen my earlier vlog on disability and the doctorate, and she asked if I'd go there again, but this time with a different focus looking at ableism and the academy. Now that's absolutely brilliant and that's why all of us need lots of Madelines in our life. And it's very appropriate, I think, that when I went back into these conversations, and I research in this area, but when I went back into the most current research, it's very clear some really powerful scholarly monographs have emerged in this area in the last eight to nine months. So I was able to really activate some current interesting provocative work to present to you today. Now, as you know, this topic's also pretty personally important to me. I was born with dyspraxia, uh, which when I was a child, so long ago, when I was a child, of course, this impairment was called clumsy child syndrome. The 70s, a classy time. Uh, clumsy child syndrome. Now, of course, that would be quite complicated if you had clumsy child syndrome as an adult, but still moving on. But as a dean with a disability, I move through the landscape of international higher education as an observer, as an observer of some odd behaviours and some pretty weird stuff. And look, I mostly move about in national higher education and not many comments are made, but every now and again someone says something weird about, gee, you got weird hand movements, gee, you've got weird hand movements, or my personal favourite when I fall over, invariably at least once a day, when I fall over, somebody says, oh, gee, you're a bit unco. <laughs> Classic Australian, uncoordinated, you're a bit unco. Yeah, mate, I am. But I, yeah, every now and again, something weird happens. So only last week, uh, I was coming down the multiple stairs of Flinders University. Flinders is set in a hill, like Simon Fraser is set in a hill for our colleagues in Canada. And so whenever you're going back down to your car, there's multiple stairs <laughs> you have to go down. And mostly I'm sort of okay. I hold on to the handrail like my life depends on it, because it probably does, and I hold on to the handrail and I'm okay. But on this particular day, I had a handbag and a box <laughs> full of papers that I was going to go through that night. And so I had a handbag, I thought I'm getting confused now, I had a handbag, I had a box, and I had four sets of stairs. And look, I had a good go, and I got down the first set of stairs and I went, yeah, I got no idea where my body is at all, I'm a bit messed up. So I end up sitting on the stair for about five minutes and just having a bit of a breath and reorienting myself and moving the bag into the box and trying all sorts of things to then go down the next set of stairs. And I got to the bottom of the stairs pretty successfully. Got some weird views of people watching this random woman <laughs> sitting on a stair, but I got down the set of stairs. And mostly these issues that I have are rarely noticed in the workplace, unless I'm, say, on a set of stairs or getting off or on an escalator, or I try and get anywhere sort of quickly, right? So I always make sure there's a nice gap between my meetings, which gives me plenty of time to get to a place or get lost multiple times <laughs> on the way to a place and, and finally get there. But it does mean I, I have an unusual vista of international higher education and I see the assumptions of our universities on a daily basis and I see how our universities avoid looking at any difference that might make them a little bit uncomfortable. And what numbers are we dealing with here? Right now when we're dealing with quant in disability studies and higher education, the numbers are woolly and complex and very difficult to triangulate because it's about declaration and discrimination exists. So if people cannot declare, they probably won't. Okay, so international studies show about 
6% of undergraduate students have a declared disability or impairment. That varies enormously per institution, per nation, per region, enormously. And when we start to hit doctoral education, firstly, the numbers are very difficult to find and they are variable depending on the funding models that exist in individual nations. But it is running between 2% and perhaps 5%. 5% particularly we see in North America in education programs, interestingly enough. But 2 to 5% is about where we're at in doctoral education. Now, in Australia, as many nations, about 20% of the Australian population has an impairment or a disability. So that means our universities are failing our citizens with disabilities and impairments, and it means our doctoral programs are failing our students with disabilities and impairments. So, okay, we're doing well. But let's move to why this is happening, and that's the discussion of ableism in the academy. And let's start with some definitions, but most importantly, let's start with you. Hello, looking at you. Let's talk about you. Think about your friends, your peers, your colleagues, your workmates in academic life. How does disability or impairment impact on your daily life? How often are you seeing a difference from you in your daily life? So disability is complex and therefore it becomes very, very difficult to combat ableism because disability manifests in such complexity, right? So ableism though is the assumption that I am like you and that that likeness is good and appropriate and benevolent. So ableism, therefore, is also a fear. It's a fear of difference. Ableism in our universities, and particularly in our doctoral programs, is organised and restructured and positioned for the able body. So our universities are organised. Our universities are punctuated for the able bodied. So ableism is about making a policy without thinking about the diverse stakeholders for that policy. So what happens is ableist policies are imposed on people rather than emerging from collaboration and conversation and dialogue co-creation, if you will. So ableism imposes all sorts of words and phrases on other people, like special needs, accommodations, modifications. There's also a configuration of those who have a different mind or a different body, configuring that difference as a sickness. A sickness that can be medicated, or a sickness that can be fixed. So ableism configures narratives. And these stories are of triumph or of despair. The argument I want to make to you today is that disability is not somebody else's problem. It's a community that anybody can join <laughs> at any time. Disabilities absolutely can emerge at birth, as mine did, or they can emerge through issues that happen after your birth, over your life, through the progression of a disease or an accidental injury. Now we use lots of words in the disability space and they all have different meanings. I'm pretty comfortable with all of them. So we have disability and I'm cool with that. We have impairments and I'm cool with that. We also have activity limitations, which is interesting. And the new one I'm watching at the moment is participation restrictions. Ableism as a term emerged 
from the United States and it came from the disability rights movement and you can see its relationship with sexism, classism, racism and so forth. It is also interdisciplinary, so the study of ableism is a radically interdisciplinary area of investigation and it explores language and behaviour and ideas and public policy and citizenship and all the assumptions we have in our life that presumes able-bodiness and therefore marginalises the crew with disabilities and marginalises them to such an extent that they're rendered invisible, that we're rendered invisible. These sorts of strategies around ableism attempt to individualise disability configuring these really brittle hierarchies that values walking over rolling, speaking over signing, and spelling supposedly independently rather than spell spelling with the aid of a spelling checker, say. So we're dealing with historically and today the consequences of this ongoing marginalisation and segregation. Ableism is historical. It does change. It can be paternalistic. It certainly can be pitying or charitable. But it is still justifying a restriction of rights and dehumanising citizens in a country. So these boundaries are negotiated around what we often term microaggressions. Now, I'm interested in that word microaggressions. I'm doing a fair amount of reading on it at the moment. I'm not quite, not quite ready to do a vlog on it yet, maybe in a couple of months. But the way that microaggressions are being used to patrol boundaries and borders, particularly in empowered institutions like universities, that's a very interesting area of discussion. And we will return to that. But one way that the the disempowerment of colleagues with impairments is managed is through these microaggressions on a daily basis. So therefore, how do we move outside of these ableist patterns? How do we start to shake up a bit how we move, how we connect, how we communicate? These questions ask us to ponder the relationships with our own bodies. So ableism is a systematic ideological bias. It is aligned with sexism and racism and heteronormativity and classism, absolutely. But why ableism is a bit different is it's probably the most invisible of all the isms. And the reason we've got invisibility in this issue is because of the complete lack of representation. As I said to you, maybe we have two to five percent of doctoral programs as being populated with our colleagues with impairments. So this invisibility takes the problem off the table because there's no representation. So if problems existed in a program around impairment and disability, they would be visible. People would be coming into my office. This is an issue. This is an issue. And so it's visible. It has to be handled, right? But because there are so few colleagues with an impairment or a disability, the problems don't emerge. The problems aren't spoken because the citizens are not in the doctoral program. So ableism confirms the limits of what is human. The value and the valuing of particular cultures, the value and valuing of particular bodies. And I always return, as I did this week when I was preparing this vlog, to Hannah Arendt and her book, The Human Condition. The Human Condition was published in 1958. And she described the most dangerous social and political condition in the world. And she described that condition as thoughtlessness. That's very deep for me. Thoughtlessness. All the challenges and problems and disasters in our world start with thoughtlessness. 
So consider how often each of us in our daily lives exhibit thoughtlessness. Perhaps you are able to move through life and you never have to think about systematic marginalisation. In a doctoral program, we have so many assumptions and we so rarely ask, what is inherited to us? What is unspoken? What do we never unpack? The discourse of public good is also part of this conversation and how we manage these complicated words, accessibility and inclusion. There are good intentions there, good intentions, some good policy is made there, but good intentions are not enough. Marguerite Schildrock described what she called, quote, a responsibility to otherness that leaves no one behind, end of quote. A responsibility to otherness. The barriers that we manage include inaccessible facilities, technologies, documents, learning activities. So the question remains is, how do we make physical spaces, all the tech, the technology, all the services, accessible to everyone. Now, of course, each of us belong to multiple identity groups and many of these identity groups are not vis visible or available for others to know and see. And each of us make choices every single day about what we disclose of ourselves to others. But consider how our world will change. If we commence with ability, a continuum of abilities. When we focus on impairment, that captures atypical capability. So psychological, physiological, anatomy. But disability captures physical or mental impairment. More interesting is when we start to think about disability as how activities are limited from us. So what are often called life limiting abilities. So we start to think again about our senses, seeing or hearing or eating or sleeping or walking or lifting or speaking, breathing, reading, concentrating, life limiting activities. Now people with disabilities have a long history of less access, less access to information, to institutions, to particular structures and strategies and rights of citizenship. And the problem we have in universities, and it's a big one, is success in universities is based on success at earlier levels of school. And indeed doctoral programs are even worse. We let people into a doctoral program on the basis of their success in universities. So if students are not moving through the system, we will never see them. So how often are we opening out the spaces of doctoral education to video, to podcasts, to screen, face-to-face, -face, synchronous, asynchronous, to allow lots of different ways of thinking about knowledge, lots of different ways of pulling in the information that's useful at a particular time. By the way, that's one of the reasons we did this vlog series, to be honest with you, that I went, let's try and think of multiple ways that ideas can be expressed in a relaxed and calm and open way. Now, so many of the questions I'm asking are really about design. Yes, born digital objects, born accessible objects, born inclusive objects. Therefore, if we do this, we can stop focusing on, what's the great phrase, functional limitations. We can start to employ multiple communication modes and 
One of the reasons I think I focus so strongly on sound and vision and all the different ways of communicating ideas is they create different points of contact and different ways of even thinking about learning. So how do we occupy space? How do we occupy the space of our identity beyond the definitions of modifications or accommodations? How do we improve this situation? Well, I've come up with five quick ways that we can do this today and going forward. I hope you'll be part of this journey with me. One, we need better data collection. We need better data collection. I think the problem with ableism is everybody who doesn't fit into this category of able, and can I say the category of able is completely undiscussed, so anybody that doesn't fit into this sort of bucket of able is then discarded into another bucket that's called disabled. Now this is obviously othering and it's obviously excluding whole communities from education. So just like we need to define and explore the word able, we need to add light and colour and texture and diversity to the word disabled. So for us as individuals, this involves us listening and recognising that every colleague with an impairment, every colleague with a disability is an expert in their own lives. And they have a right to share that expertise on their own terms. So instead of maintaining these ableist categories, which includes, of course, disabled, we have to start creating authentic, meaningful and diverse strategies and definitions to create the meaningful research to show that disability is not about other people. Disability is about us. Let's get some good data. Two, we need to create a trusting and collaborative space without the fear of discrimination. Disability data sets, quite rightly, are based on self-identification and self-disclosure. And that's incredibly important. That's about citizenship. That's about rights. And rights are determined and guaranteed through this privacy, confidentiality and disclosure. But because we live in an ableist academy, with the focus on modifications based on disclosure rather than universal design, disabilities will always be underreported because when they are reported, discrimination results. So ableism will end, it will end, if we can focus on abilities rather than accommodations, universal design and not modifications, diversity rather than homology, and standards rather than standardisation. So how do we transform doctoral education? Now I think there are three strategies to do this and I call this the DLL strategy. And obviously the key first one is design. We need to start with design. And we use my three Ds, digitisation, deterritorialization disintermediation. We cut information and interfaces up in very different ways to suit different groups. It's all available to cut the cloth in different ways for different groups. So all information is available in these diverse ways, not modified, but designed for diverse use. Then follows with the L, which is listening. The best design in the world is meaningless unless we listen to the users because so few PhD students have a disability, because so few academics have a disability, it's easy to continue the invisibility, pretend there's no problem, because the injustices are so great that we are just simply untouched by disability in our daily lives. But the students that we have deserve respect, and deserve space. And we confirm those rights through the gift of listening, validating the rights of others through our silence and through our active listening and caring of what is being told to us. And this DLL finishes obviously with literacies. 
We create open learning cultures, enabling the learning of others. And we build relationships between all the support structures of the university. Three, summoning the pathway to success. So if we want to change our universities, we need to change who's employed at our universities. And you know how we change who is employed at our university? We transform our doctoral programs. Change starts with the PhD. Therefore, when any of us have the option or the opportunity to be employing a colleague in a university, if you ever have the chance to be on a selection panel, always say yes, always say yes. And when you're on that selection panel, stand up for an open process. Because you know what? Ableism continues while we continue to hire as we hired in the past. When we hire mates, when we stop the open process, we just sort of allow, oh, look, I know them, or that's a posh university, and we just allow these processes to keep going on. That allows ableism to continue. So therefore, if we want to make change happen, then we intervene in the processes of higher education and we increase the number of people in our universities with an impairment or a disability. Four, outreach to future students. Only 6% of students in our universities have an impairment or disability declared. Therefore, these students require respect, support and care to enable them to move into a doctoral program. You've often heard me say that a PhD program commences in the first lecture in first year, but it's also important that a supportive supervisory relationship is created, a strong supervisory culture. It is incredibly important that our supervisors are well trained, that they understand the differences that PhD students confront, how timelines shift and move in a project, and how we open out and welcome the expectations and the opportunities for all students. Five. Promote the enabling university and the future will change. Now for this final bit, I'm quoting the research of Mike Kent. I'm smiling because Mike Kent was my former PhD student 20 years ago. Hi Mike. Mike completed his PhD, his truly brilliant PhD, as a student with dyslexia. And at the time, it was the time of new media, man. And we did everything we could to sort of use the new interfaces to really create an innovative, exciting environment for Mike. And it was a pleasure co-designing these interesting strategies with him. And he finished his PhD in two and a half years. Now, interestingly, his PhD was on how the online environment is neo-colonial. So we looked at the internet and the web and showed how neo-colonial structures were continuing through it. So a truly brilliant thesis that didn't look at disability. But Mike's research has gone on to be, he is now one of the handful of the greatest scholars in the world exploring the relationship between disability and digitisation. And Mike Kent is now Professor Mike Kent. So proud of you, Mike. Wow. Mike's research has confirmed that if universities actively promote themselves as disability friendly, then you know what? Students are welcomed and students enrol. And let me just give you one example from Flinders University. The year after I released that vlog on disability and the doctorate, the year after, the applicants for Flinders University scholarships featured 15% of students with a declared 
disability or impairment. So if people in power, I suppose I'm in power, people in power say, we want you, we welcome you, we love you, we care about you, we are creating systems and structures that undulate with your fabulousness. If we put that out there, book them and they will come. This openness, this welcomeness, this outwardness commences with the application process that reveals the support structures, the respect for privacy for all our candidates. And of course this includes the incredible support of our libraries and our remarkable librarians. Thinking about alternative delivery systems, interface management, my partnership with our wonderful librarians at Flinders University on impairment issues I think is world class. And of course what all of this is about is ensuring full mobility is in place between online and offline architecture and services. And students being able to select the training, select the bits of the story that suits them at different times. Universal design, open access. But most importantly, this is about critiquing hard, critiquing the ableist academy. And this starts when we build relationships. This is more than accommodation. This is more than access. This is a cultural revolution. This is change of a high order. And this change challenges the very history of higher education. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.